Ralph Waldo Emerson. This is the pretend topic of the video today. He's a essayist and a bit of a poet. Oh, here. There you go. <laughs> He's an essayist and a bit of a poet. I have a collection of his works here. I started reading it, and the first thing I thought was, ooh, interesting. He's a transcendentalist. I'm sure he has a lot of fascinating things to say. But he does, but there's a catch. He's not that interesting. Um, so I read a bit from his essay, uh, Nature, which is one of his earliest essays, where he basically exalts nature. He says we can learn all sorts of things from nature. Uh, the whole pursuit of science is based around the discovery of truth from nature. Um, so, you know, he has a little bit of a point. Uh, he was writing in the 1800s, so a little bit ago, but still close enough that his uh, view of science was very similar to ours. Although I don't know how experimental it was at that point. Fantastic. Um, what's the problem? Well, I couldn't get through it. And it's not that I can't get through old essays. Um, in two of my videos, I've gone through uh, Samuel Johnson's essays, uh, namely just the one on fiction, but I guess it's relevant to my uh, studies, so that's the one I'd check out. Um, among some of his other works and storytelling, and I thought, wait a second, Samuel Johnson was also writing around this period. He was British. Uh, Emerson is American. Why don't I compare them? So I started in my head comparing the two. And you know what? Johnson just wins. So I'm actually not going to be finishing that Natron essay by Emerson. I read some of his poems. They're all right. But he's not quite the genius that his place in the literary canon uh, seems to suggest, at least not in my opinion. Maybe there's some sort of brilliance I'm missing. Um, maybe his most famous pieces are better, but not what I've checked out. So I was going to leave that anthology at work and read it whenever I had like lunch or a break or something, but I took it home because I'm going to find something else. Um, and maybe I'll grab my Samuel Johnson book, but I feel like that'd be a little bit too on point. So let's move on. Um, now, this is a more controversial topic. And I wasn't sure how to broach the subject. So instead, I'll do it similar to what I just did, which is a little book review. Now, as you can see, we have a lot of time left, so... Um, uh, so I'll take my time, or I'll be more in-depth. So this is a forward by Robert Hand. The beginning of wisdom is one of the more interesting introductions to astrology. Of those texts written in the Middle Ages, in addition to being very... Um, a very comprehensive basic introduction to astrology of the Arabic era, it contains much more lore that is either not found or is not as clearly evident in other sources. I should like to use this for to give a brief summary of the highlights of the texts as they occur in various chapters. And I will not read his brief summary. I just wanted to get a nice introduction here. Um, let me plug in the lamp. How's that for lighting? I look red. We'll stick with natural lighting. <sighs> Rabbi Avram Ibn Ezra, 1086-1164 in Spain. This multifaceted Jewish scholar wrote the beginning of wisdom in the year 1148 as a basic textbook of astrology. Um, then it's followed by the Book of Reasons, which by the way is very hard to find. Uh, it's not on Amazon. I've already translated for Project Hindsight. Book of Reasons is Ibn Ezra's additional commentary to the beginning of wisdom. I included a broader description of his life works there. So, 
I'm often asked about Jewish astrology, especially in connection with Ibn Ezra. His writings are traditional Arabic astrology. He is neither Kabbalistic nor religious. Yet, at times, his Jewishness shines through in little phrases, what I call his Talmudic style, which is more apparent in Beginning of Reason. Ibn Ezra also wrote, wrote commentaries on the Bible, which are, in which he included astrological references. So, uh, that's from the translator. Now, interestingly, um, all of these signs have Hebrew names, um, but I'm going to hold off on that now and explain astrology. You seem like a scholarly young gentleman with a strong foundation in science. That's right. Um, it turns out that most people do not take the science courses in university, and especially not at the highest level. The um, Depending on the stream, it might be called a uh, university preparation or university level high school courses or advanced high school courses or academic level high school courses the top of the if you have three streams now um i did okay i took grade 11 chemistry grade 12 chemistry i took grade 11 physics grade 12 physics and then i took calculus and vectors not pre-calc actual calculus and vectors um, and then in university I actually took the high school equivalent biology courses and they're basically electives <clears throat> but for people who say are going to be in biology but maybe they're older and they haven't taken biology in high school or the use of those high school credits are kind of expired maybe 10 years later um, then those then they would take the biology courses and it would count the same way that a high school credit transferring over would count. So I took the two biology, macro and microbiology. Um, so yeah, I'm a little bit of a science artist. <laughs> um, my inclination towards art or um, more liberal art scholarship is much better or much higher, sorry. but. Actually, I think my faculties are more inclined towards the mathematic um, and the... I can memorize biological clades very easily. If you don't know what that is, don't worry. You can Google it. Um, so, this is strange, but it's actually not that strange if you think about it. See, I tend to read uh, poets and scholars who wrote in the 1800s, in the 1500s, in the 1600s, right? Sir Corwin Wallace the Great, Samuel Johnson I just mentioned. Um, I, I read some of the, I'm interested in reading. I've read a few pages of some of the letters of Isaac Newton. I've read a couple of pages of his Principia Mathematica. Um, uh, Francis Bacon wrote essays, right? He was also a scientist. Fun fact, he helped invent the scientific method Um, so, why am I talking about this? Well, early, if you go back only a few centuries, astrology was a science. It was up there as a type of math, actually. There are three, um, <clears throat> there are three sorts of astrology. There's judicial astrology, which is things like horoscopes and forecasting and divination and there's mathematic astrology, right, where we measure angles and things like that. Um, and there's medical astrology, which has uh, come out of favor. And so mathematical astrology we now call astronomy, right? And they used to call it that, too. It's not like that's a new term. So it turns out in some circles of Judaism, especially like Ibn Ezra was Spanish, I assume... That means he was Sephardic. Maybe those differentiations hadn't come about in the 1100s. Um, but they seem to be a little more open to the ideas of astrology, probably because they didn't have the European uh, Christians banging on their door to make them stop. As they, well, they often did a lot of worse things uh, to the Jewish people in medieval times. And even now. Anyway, they approach it as a science. And we don't do any judicial astrology. Um, the And actually, it's interesting that modern astrology is tending towards the psychological because that's the only 
available avenue other than, say, medical or mathematic, um, where you can study astrology under Judaism, because divination is, of course, forbidden. So what's the use of astrology? I was talking to my brother the other day, and he said, he said, he looked up his sign, which is Sagittarius, which is my rising, by the way, and he said, wow, these all match. They actually fit me, except for a few things here and there. And I said, interesting. And he said, well, I thought maybe they all sort of fit you, right? They're vague enough and agreeable enough that you'll just say, yeah, that's me. So he looked up another few signs, and they didn't fit him at all. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's you know, centuries of development, right? Um, so do the stars actually affect you? Well, even if they do, we know from the Bible that it doesn't matter because you can change your fate. We have something called free will. You must choose life that you may live, goes the famous passage, I think, in Deuteronomy. A similar sentiment was also said to Cain. Um, and actually, some translations, the, the verbiage in that is very interesting, the tense. It's not you should choose life that you may live. It's more like you will choose life that you may live. Like, regardless of what happens, eventually you'll come around to it which is somewhat comforting, depending on who you are. Um, so I've gotten a little bit into astrology. Uh, there's one rabbi on YouTube whose YouTube channel is called 7200 Beverly. That's 7200 Beverly. Um, his name is Rabbi Eliyahu Kin, and he actually covers all 12 signs. Um, the Jewish approach to astrology, uh, this is the Arabic approach, as the translator said. The Jewish approach you're going to find in ancient texts like the Talmud, is more not about signs it's about uh, the day of the week you were born on the hour under which you were born and what planet influences which but especially there are seven days of creation and the day of the week we know the jewish people know which day of the week creation started i believe it was sunday <clears throat> right because on the seventh day he rested and the seventh day is the sabbath uh, saturday so depending on what was created during that day affects your character if you were created or born on that day. So that's fascinating. Um, I actually have a textbook which un outlines that and a lot of, a lot of other um, um, interesting, more satellite Jewish topics like uh, what's the Jewish view of ghosts and dreams and things like that. I'll probably bring that book in sometime. So as I said in the previous video i wanted to make videos talking about texts and actually reading them i'm not doing a whole lot of reading this time um but i think the next video i'm gonna grab a text and read it and comment on it and see where we can go from there and i'm gonna start integrating those into the vlog um until i get confident enough where i'm actually gonna start a whole new channel just for um, reading and commenting, talking about literary criticism and theory, talking about context, uh, writers, sort of this sort of scholarly stuff. And anybody who checks out that channel will get a half decent uh, English education, at least as far as a bachelor of English literature can get. Might also talk about writing since it's relevant. I'd also talk about popular artists or indie artists, since I'm kind of part of the indie web on Twitter. So thanks for watching. We're going to end it a minute early. Um, remember, kids, when it comes to astrology, divination and seeing the future is forbidden, which means most horoscopes are not allowed. But checking out your chart, it's all right. Seeing the character of your sign, finding the strong points and working on those, um, specializing, right? as modern society likes us to do. Find your weak points and, and uh, fixing them and addressing them. This is the use of astrology, to make your character stronger. At least that's the religious perspective. This is Daniel Trine. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.